I guess I was thinking about just what it means to make a film as a shy radical and the, the way that like um, making a book or writing a book feels to me like instinctively quite apt as a kind of as a kind of thing to do as someone who's a, who's a shy radical and whether there was any differences between that and making a film or just if you could give us some insights into how the film came about and yeah and what the process was like. Um, it's a very odd type of book there's no narrative there's no characters and it's built on like um, so I take this radical idea that everything is fiction so um, everything from you know we're always encountering forms of writing like uh, the law or a menu or the, the, the blurby thing for this and those can all be formats for fiction um, so answering your question um, you really confounded me. Oh, no, no. <laughs> how, how did the film come about? What, what was the? So uh, there's a there's a there's a little, uh, as the director describes, an introvert bookshop in Margate. Um, so Margate's uh, like a hidden Shoreditch, I guess. There's a creative community there. Um, there's all sorts of uh, venues that. Um, so there's a, there's a venue called the Shell Grotto in um, in Margate, which you see right at the beginning of the film, and it's literally a mystery underground cave made entirely of seashells. Um, so that was incubating in there was part of the process for this. And the film was also shot just before COVID broke. Um, the, the scene shot in uh, Oxford Street around Chinatown. There were rumours, urban rumours, of Chinatown being evacuated or a sort of a xenophobia around Chinatown, uh, given the first wave of COVID. Um, my relationship to the camera is also uh, very much related to uh, my brother's um, incarceration. So uh, my brother, I'm, I'm, I've been very actively involved in a lot of the war and terror campaigns. I don't know if people have seen the film The Mauritanian or... Um, about the Guantanamo, so I, I'm friends with a lot of the ex Guantanamo prisoners, um, and uh, my brother's part of that nexus or one of the sort of human rights abuses uh, at the time. Um, he was detained without trial for uh, eight year, uh, uh, six years, and then put into solitary confinement. And so my relationship to the camera is about putting truth against a uh, hysterical. Uh, uh, media climate uh, created through uh, news bulletins which are quite violent in terms of uh, demonizing people um, giving no context to things uh, like the way uh, euphemisms for for forms of uh, violence and so I was thrust so I had Theresa May an entire British establishment and the I think it was George Bush uh, at the time when my brother was incarcerated producing their sort of Fox News and a type of uh, media which uh, yeah was quite violent and dehumanizing and then I guess it's an as aspect of speaking truth to power uh, and people say how can you speak publicly even uh, whilst aligning with this introvert thing so I mean I have two conditions to speak in public one like um, I have to read lots of books about the topic and two, I have to have cried about it in my bedroom. And they're the only two conditions for, um, and, and it's the same for um, the f film as well. Uh, a lot of the scenes were devised. It was a very highly collaborative film. Um, I mean, there's p pits I put in the film. So there's a um, close up of the court transcripts, for example. I mean, that's, I mean, who puts court transcripts in a film? Tom, come, come, come from a background of directing mu music videos, Black Dog Films with the production um, company behind it as part of uh, Ridley Scott's um, branch of production companies. Uh, they mainly direct music videos. And I think the most famous music video is Bjork's All Is Full Of Love. And so Tom and I developed this relationship through, uh, we're about the same age. So sort of the 1990s is this golden age of reality before uh, social media creates a hyper hyper reality um, and sort of bonding over those that period of music when people actually bought physical things um, and, and that was my relationship to, to the camera and I even suggested a lot of angles in the film too um, and there's, there's also a lot of the film which is not actually um, so we shot about probably seven films and then we condensed it for like short film entry film, which is a, you know, so it's a very dense 
every, every aspect of the film could be unpacked a lot. So uh, there's, there's a, a location I shot, which is in the Central Library in Ljubljana in Slovenia. And so for, for those who don't know, so I, I have the book and then I develop art projects out of the book. So one of the biggest art projects I did was a referendum. So people could vote to be part of the state of Aspergistan in an exhibition in Slovenia, uh, which we actually, and we actually won the referendum. So I do have a democratic mandate as the commander in chief of the global movement to destroy extra debt supremacy. And, uh, and it also won the election in Poland, which is uh, great in terms of how things are. So I think it sets itself, it's a very unconventional form of film and it does set itself against like, you know, you have the standard 25 minute, like, I don't know, um, CNN type documentary, you have news bulletins, I mean, it's sort of ripping all those things apart. Um, so, I mean, actually, the, the, the one of the biggest expenses was that BBC archive, you see, they actually charge thousands of pounds for the archive material, but we took that and stretched it into an entire more humanising, I mean, they're not going to show, uh, you know, a lot of the films in, um, I think it's 60 mil or 8 mil, um, and, you know, you're not going to show 8 mil footage of my parents in the house, and in a, a sort of news bulletin, but then that gives a dimension you need and that gives uh, things. So I think it's also a radical form of filmmaking which actually breaks uh, those conventions. But also a lot of the filmmaking is actually quite banal in terms of you do walk up the same set of stairs about eight times. I can understand why um, film stars become like junkies and uh, ruin their lives. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, you're very funny. And, I, <laughs> and uh, I wondered, like, yeah, and that gets mentioned in the, in the film as well, that you're, as we just saw there, what for you is the importance of humour in there? Because it's so, it's so weighty and it's so serious and it's so urgent, but then it's also you dealing with it in a way that is, doesn't in any way shy away from humour. Yeah, um, I think one of the earliest films that really inspired me was uh, R Roberto Benigni's Life is Beautiful, which is a comedy set in the Holocaust during concentration camp. Um, and uh, I also think Four Lions, Chris Morris and British comedy is uh, of, of interest to me. Um, I, I know, I, I think I just need validation. <laughs> so, like, if you laugh, I know you've connected it in some way um, too. Um, and there's an element of sort of knowing. Um, I, it's actually not as funny as I'd like it to be. I'd, like, I'd actually like John Waters to be the director of a future show, <laughs> Radicals. <laughs> Um, or um, I, I love um, Jack Hill, these films like and Switchblade Sisters and Coffee Brown in these camp. Um, I think there's something in camp and irony that like, uh, I, you know, when you're a so-called disabled person and I've been classified disabled under until the Conservative government came and reclassified what disabled means, you're subject to all these forms of administration and bureaucracy and taking a more sort of, you don't totally take your diagnosis seriously you know, totally take the administration seriously. They're all approximations. And, and uh, when you meet an audience member who gets your sense of humour, uh, there's a, a, another form of knowledge and knowing uh, and recognition. And um, yeah, um, also in that film, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot to unpack. So in the introvert emergency rescue hotline, we, we really, in directing this film, we made we actually made a real emergency uh, introvert rescue emergency hotline which people could actually dial in and we put the adverts all over social media so people actually dialed in and gave their real life testimonies. Uh, one of the voices you hear is uh, uh, one of my dearest friends Don Biswas who's one of the fellow gang members I, I, I met. At. I recommend anyone uh, google Don Biswas, he's a dyspraxic, autistic, depressive comedian, somehow very funny and, 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 and integrates that into his actual uh, performance. I also like if I fell, like if I was awkward or or like, you know, flip up, you know, I've always got a back in, you know, because I'm all good, right? <laughs> yeah. I might ask one more question, if that's all right, which is a question I asked when I wrote in your book, in pen, uh, which is like, so I'm thinking about when I was, I remember being a, uh, a young teenager and having a new teacher. And for some reason, the teacher immediately identified me as being a quiet kid and said like, oh, this is, I can see Daniel that you're a quiet kid and he said that loudly to the whole class and my response was to very loudly say no I'm not <laughs> um, and I feel like since then that's been my way of engaging in like extrovert supremacies 
is to be like loud and awkward. But I know that I come with, I, may, I associate this with dyspraxia somehow, that I come with like an accidental awkward, uh, loudness and awkwardness, awkward loudness. And, and so I wonder if shyness is always related to volume. <laughs> That's for me. Not an interesting philosophical question that I could <laughs> go on for ages. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful bit in Daniel's book called Why Awkwardness is Great. And I always make him read it, like, but time to he won't do that, but you can always get his book. I, I, I don't, I actually think so. I, I mean, a lot, I was a fan, I used to do sound art and I was a fan of a lot of avant-garde music. I, I was a big fan of Sonic Youth, the alternative rock band. And sometimes they do these, they just play these noise things, which is just pure noise. And there's no melody, there's no cordiality. It's just pure noise. And, and, and I like um, Japanese avant-garde musicians like Merzbo, where it's again, just pure signal noise. I like the Lou Reed album, Metal Machine Music, which is again, a form of, pure noise and pure so like people who actually enjoy that type of stuff that requires a very intense form of listening and so so I would say this shyness is about listening so I'm I'm interested in a structural uh, transformation of politics which puts listening at the center rather than speaking um, but I also reflect of how universal this trope is of the quiet kid so as you see in the film, the film has developed this sort of global following and the books developed this global following. And so some of my fans in Beijing, they relate to this trope of the quiet fat kid. Mm. <laughs> they're sort of still like whether it's sort of Mexico or, or um, Brazil or, or wherever in the world, it's this, 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 this trope of the quiet kid seems to resonate uh, so universally and so broadly across classes, races, geographies, and uh, one day we're all going to unify and um, overthrow the world order. The constitution of the Aspergistan state, which is uh, Britain, um, and uh, uh, reparations and uh, uh, redress. Um, I think we already there's already forms of real existing Aspergistan, even in this library here right now, uh, are sitting next together. I think the poetry library in uh, in the South Bank Centre, which is almost always empty, but has this huge, I think that's real existing Aspergistan. I think a lot of the film was shot in Ljubljana in Slovenia. And even though it's a capital city, there's, there's no place in it like Times Square or Leicester Square. It's like... Um, it's almost like and the entire architecture of the city, which is defined by this architect called um, Jose Plesnik, uh, who's like the Gordy of the city, who's designing all of it. He, he had a very introvert lifestyle. So even the bridge is split into three, the central bridge in the city. So there's no, even the city's center is introvert. There's, there's nowhere there's a traffic jam. Um, and, and the sort of um, uh, classical sense of the city is there where it's not, you know, never, under century overload. Um, I also think uh, in terms of, there's also a dismantlement of real existing Asperkistan in terms of there's there's a war against uh, public space, which is quiet. So libraries have been closed by hundreds by, by the conservative government. And you could, you could define that by um, uh, neoliberalism as a war against public spending, but you could also define that as a war against uh, quiet space. Uh, so one of my fans uh, called Partly Robot in uh, Portland, Oregon. He just he just took a photograph of uh, his favorite corner uh, in his bedroom where he sits and reads books, and he says, "Oh, I Aspergistan already exists. It's in the corner of my room." I still think we need to reinvent what socializing is. There's a phrase I saw somewhere, fluency in silence. Um, so, uh, and, and there were, um, I don't know, there were things I enjoyed, and this is probably going off time, like, I really enjoyed like Quakers meetings where the form of worship is sitting in silence. Um, I, I, I mean, like I agree, there isn't one um, like atypical form of, uh, like uh, there's a there's a whole um diversity within the neurodiversity thing um and uh 
I think it's I think there's all there's a consciousness though that there's something to be negotiated. So you don't always assume this is the correct way of being. Like yesterday, I think we were invited to the red carpet gala, and obviously that's something that makes me terrified and shrink away, and that's very extrovert normative and very extrovert supremacist. Um, and there's like an awareness there's something to be negotiated, or m the validity of the person who uh, wants to withdraw. Uh, really oddly though, so there is actually an extrovert fan base of Show Radicals too. And they said, oh, well, there's some people who said they converted to introversion from that. But the, there's also the extrovert fan base who said it made them more a sensitive and aware person too. Um, so I, I don't, so I think, uh, I mean, even as you speak, you're not speaking as like an opponent. Um, but I think the, the way I, a lot of us experience the world is like a, a boot on our head and we have to live with it whether we like it or not and um th that's just the way the world is um so like the consciousness that isn't just the way the world is plus in inhabiting spaces like people are like why are you on instagram isn't that where kim kardashian and like extrovert supremacy thrives or people are like oh wh why would you go to a football match because a football stadium is inherently extrovert or something like that but that's to me the reason why one should occupy their spaces anyway because to re-inhabit them and redefine them so one can redefine um football stadiums i mean you have some football stadiums like arsenal is called the library right the, the stadium there but you can redefine that as a cathedral experience and similarly i have a presence on instagram look at, at show radicals uh, on instagram <laughs> uh, it's um similarly i occupy that space because it is over, like nothing is inherently anything, you know, so even loud noise itself is not inherently uh, in whatever uh, neurotypical extra, the reason we should stay there and not move. Like when I was in residency at Jan van Eyck Academy, an art academy in the Netherlands, and uh, they would have these rave parties outside my window every single night, sometimes at 4am, which I naturally hated. And, um, and, and the director of the academy was like, oh, you should just have another studio move like to the other side of the like uh, room but th but that was the reason I was like no I'm gonna stay here and they're gonna accommodate the fact that I find this uh, intolerable and unbearable and then uh, they can become better so the democratic structures reopened and is always open for us I guess that's my answer I actually it brought in neurodiversity to so I, I, a lot of show radicals. It's not just a book; it's this discourse that lives on and on and on uh, through all the tours and stuff. So I did a event for the Open Studio called Radical Roundtable around neurodiversity. Uh, it, there's a very uneven. I'm not sure everyone in the room knows what neurodiversity is, but it's also it's part of a new wave of progressive movements, uh, which is inspired in some ways by uh, LGBTQI. Uh, movements in terms of these things were once seen as simply a pathology or something to be corrected uh, but instead look at that as a sort of another sensibility another language so I did this radical roundtable around neurodiversity in the Netherlands uh, I think Britain is actually one of the best places in the world so I don't want to <laughs> lose my decolonial cred there um, <laughs> yeah for actually recognition of neurodiversity so I actually so, you know like Tate Modern has uh, quiet room, it, it, it's neurodiversity is built in into its inclusion structure. I think also in the BFI, like that's not uniform in other in other places like Germany or, or, or Netherlands or other places in Europe I've been. Uh, Netherlands didn't have that institutional recognition uh, within that academy uh, until I put it on the table. Uh, and a number of participants actually left who also neuroatypical. Um, so uh, yeah, so actually neurodiversity gave me a um, a sort of a, a sort of a, a sort of a framework, uh, a rights framework in which to negotiate with them. Um, and there's some really good developments here. So uh, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, there was a branch within the Labour Party called Neurodivergent Labour. And it was led by someone called Janine Booth, who's a trade unionist. So she looked at trade union motions, policies, uh, frameworks in which to uh, uh, assert that 
uh, equality. One thing they have in the Netherlands, though, that we don't have here is they have this award called Neurodiverse um, Politician of the Year. I mean, I, I don't know who would win Neurodiverse Politician of the Year in British Parliament, but um, interesting to think about. <laughs>